Our scripture reading uh, this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, and can be found on page 1013 in the Pew Bibles or naturally on the screen up here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bury son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. One of the darkest chapters of human history was the Holocaust. That period between 1941 and 1945, when the Nazi Germans had, they, they, they killed pure genocide of roughly six million Jews. It was one of the most blatant and cruelest examples of ethnic extermination that there ever has been. To be Jewish in Europe in the 1940s was to live in constant fear and grief. Their humanity was stripped from them in every conceivable way to the point that even their hope was stolen. It was the embodiment of pure evil. And yet, in a dark and damp cellar in Cologne, Germany, where thousands of Jews had cowered and hidden in total terror from the Nazi torment and threat. There was an inscription found on a wall shortly after the end of World War II. Scrawled across a stone wall by an anonymous author were the words that defied the unspeakable evil of the Holocaust. They're the ones that you heard Nicole and I just sing. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I don't feel it. 
I believe in God even when God is silent. Now that may seem like an odd way to begin this liturgical season of Advent, which, as you know, our little church shares its name with it. Because the season of Advent is the time of year that we spend preparing for Christmas, both inside and outside the walls of the church. Now, granted, even though out in the secular world it's not known as Advent, but it's the same thing, basically. As Christians, we know that preparing for the birth of Christ means that we are, are, are sharing our, our, our story with all of those who cried out, who prayed for a Savior for thousands of years, before and after the actual event itself. And then as citizens of the world, we know that preparing for Christmas basically means buying Christmas presents, dragging the the decorations out of storage, and trying to get an accurate headcount for Christmas dinner. But either way, it means that somehow we're trying to sanitize or soften the story. But honestly speaking, the story of the birth of Christ and the events leading up to it is anything but perfect and beautiful. It's filled with all kinds of messy and less than perfect, but completely relatable themes of the human experience. Themes like unknowing, and fear, and oppression, and doubt, and disgrace, and hardship. And the Advent season itself is actually one of lament, of acknowledging all of those things that I just listed, and a time when we cry out from the darkest depths of our humanity and become acutely aware of our need for a savior. That is how we are meant to prepare for Christmas. And so this Advent season, these weeks leading up to Christmas, we are not going to try to scrub clean the Christmas story, nor are we going to try to file down any of its sharp edges. Each week until Christmas, we're going to look at the story through a different lens, through each of the lenses of the gospel writers. The first chapter of each gospel will be our reading throughout these next weeks. Because they each have their own take on the story on the entire story of Christ, but particularly the story of his birth and entry into our world. And that will shape our journey as we go towards Bethlehem and the manger. But in the midst of that, we're also going to remember those hopeful words etched into such hopelessness. That spark of light in the midst of suffocating darkness. I believe even when. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, today we enter into the season that prepares us to receive the Christ child into our lives, the light of the world, the hope of all people. Help us to receive your word and your spirit into our hearts in this moment so that we can know what it is you have to say to us. Amen. She was barely out of childhood, probably about 12 or 13 years old. Granted, they matured a great deal faster then, but biologically speaking, a couple of thousand years is not enough to change what we know about human development. In other words, young girls that age today have more in common with her than they don't. She was preparing herself to live a life that for the most part had been already planned out for her. Just like it had been for her mother, and her mother's mother before that, and so on and so forth. Because that's how it was for women at that time. Their lives and their bodies and their futures didn't belong to them. They belonged mostly to the men in their lives, but most of all to the man that was assigned to become her husband. In Mary's case, that was a young carpenter named Joseph. We don't know much about him, but based on what we know about the culture at the time, Mary's engagement, or betrothal, as you will often hear it said, 
to Joseph was practically as binding as marriage itself. And breaking that agreement would have been seen as an egregious breach of contract, so much so that it would have marked Mary as completely unworthy for any future husband or marriage. Considering the fact that a woman's only hope in that time for security or sustainability was from a husband, this meant certain destitution and probable death to Mary, whether it was immediate, we at least know it was imminent. And there would have been no more definitive nor scandalous breach of the betrothal contract than for Mary to come up pregnant with a child that was not Joseph's. It was basically the worst thing that could happen to her. Best case scenario, she would be ostracized, the object of scorn and derision for the rest of her life. Worst case scenario was death by stoning. It didn't get any better. And yet in the first chapter of Luke, <clears throat> we hear this. God sent the angel, Gabri the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary who was engaged to a man named Joseph. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And at that point, Gabriel went on to explain to her how this son that she was going to give birth to would be a great and powerful leader and how his kingdom would know no end. But you got to kind of imagine that Mary maybe wasn't paying really close attention because her head was spinning. She was trying to wrap her head around what she was hearing. And the first thing that came out of her mouth was, what, what, it, no, that's impossible, because I've never even been with a man. There is no way that this can happen. And then came the bombshell. Gabriel said, this would be God's son, conceived only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel's first words to Mary were that she was favored by God. And then as he proceeded to explain that proof of that favor was that she was going to have a child out of wedlock that wasn't Joseph's. The one thing that would most threaten her life and her future it was probably one of the most profound examples of cognitive dissonance that there has ever been. Now, we've all heard the phrase, you can probably say it with me. God doesn't give us any more than God thinks we can handle. And it's supposed to make us feel better when we're in the midst of the darkest moments of our lives. And it's kind of like we're saying that we're highly favored because bad things are happening to us. Something like the greater the trial, the higher God's opinion must be of us. And I guess at first glance, the thought that God has such confidence in us, it does help a little bit. But the fact is that in those moments of tremendous darkness, it's overwhelming. You can't feel the favor. All you feel is perhaps the sun will never shine again. In spite of whether or not God thinks we got this. It feels more like we're alone in that darkness rather than the object of any favor, especially God's. What must, what must Mary's world have looked like to her in that moment? She was in an impossible situation, and she knew it. Even her own family wasn't going to be able to defend her if they even wanted to try. And that was a big if. Her, her eyes gazed into the darkness, trying to see any light of hope, however dim or imperceptible. 
And while none of us will ever know exactly what Mary was going through, we have, many of us, so many of us, have struggled with moments of confusion and darkness and despair. And there's not a single human on earth that is immune from those earth-shaking moments that can come out of any place at any time. They can happen as quickly as a phone can ring or as long as it takes someone to say, hey, do you have a second? They can come with a cough or a twinge or maybe out of silence that shouldn't be there. Whatever it is or wherever it comes from, our lives will be forever divided between everything that came before that moment and everything that came after it. And as we stare into that impossible situation, trying to wrap our heads around what is going on, often the very first words that come to us and the very first thing we say is, this, how can this be? This is impossible. I can't do this. How is the sun ever going to shine again? And this is where the season of Advent meets us. It's at that place of lament where we cry out from the darkest depths of our humanity and become acutely aware of our need for a savior. Where words of hope <clears throat> can be etched into our hopelessness. And we only need to look to Mary to catch a glimpse of that spark of light in the midst of suffocating darkness. Because in spite of of her confusion and her fear, the one thing she tried the most to do was remember that God is in charge of her life. Chances are, it wasn't as easy as Luke tries to tell us it was for her. But we can still see a frightened young woman trying to remain open to just the possibility of hope. And if she hadn't tried to remain open to that possibility, she might have missed Gabriel's final words to her in that moment. Words that gave her the strength to trust in God. And it was with that trust that she was able to open the door for God to bless her and all of the world through her. Gabriel's final words to Mary have the power to bring good news to the poor, give sight to the blind, and set the captives free. They are quite possibly the most powerful words in the entire universe, and they can even, they can even give us hope in the face of utter despair. Gabriel's words were not lost on Mary, and they mustn't be lost on us. Nothing is impossible with God. That is the power of the season of Advent. Of not rushing to Christmas and instead spending some time in these dark moments of Advent. Waiting and preparing, surrendering to our need for a savior. Putting all of our faith and trust into the power of God to do things in, through, and around us that are so astounding that they can only come from God. Finding the strength to say, even if it is with the faintest of whispers, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. Hanging on to the belief that what Gabriel said to Mary in those final moments is the absolute truth. Nothing is impossible with God. There's another story of a victim of the Nazis. This time, he wasn't Jewish, but he did give his life to resisting the Nazi evil. He too had been thrown in to the dark pit of despair and darkness and hopelessness. Because of a failed attempt to stop Hitler and end his tyranny, theologian and writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been arrested 
captured, imprisoned. He was there for two years until his brutal execution, which happened only a couple of weeks before the camp he was being held in was liberated. And yet while he was in prison, he kept writing. And he never lost his faith. And he offered the world some of the most profound expressions of that faith and hope in the midst of what could only seem. I can't even imagine what it was like, but could have only seemed like absolute and total darkness. Listen to his testament to faith. A prison cell in which one waits, hopes, and is completely dependent on the fact that the door of freedom has to be opened from the outside is not a bad picture of Advent. Think about that for a minute. It's just another way of saying nothing is impossible with God. That's the story that the Advent season wants to tell us. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what we think will happen or how hopeless a situation may seem. Nothing is impossible with God. Things may not turn out the way they would if we were the authors of the story. Neither Mary's nor Dietrich Bonhoeffer's stories were soft or sanitized and quite possibly would have been written differently by them. But the author of all creation, the ruler of time and space, can take the darkest and most hopeless-seeming narrative and turn it into the most beautiful and life-giving expression of power and love and grace. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. So let's not move too quickly to the manger this season. Let's not be afraid to spend just a little time staring into the darkness of Advent. Seeing the parts of the Christmas story that we usually like to turn away from. The messy and less than perfect and sharp-edged parts of the human experience, that unknowing, that fear, that oppression, that doubt, the disgrace, the hardship. Because that's our story too. And if we're willing to stay in that place, we might catch a glimpse of that spark of light in the darkness and find the strength to say, even if it is with the faintest of whispers, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you and you alone are God. You hold every part of the universe in your hands. You are mighty and you are powerful. You speak and oceans rise. You speak and storms are calmed. And you are closer to us than our own breath. You are in charge of all things, all time and space. And you hold us in your hand. We know of no greater comfort than to know these things. And yet we do confess that in moments of darkness, we do become overwhelmed. We become frightened. And so in those moments, Lord God, we do need you to open that door from the outside and offer to us your grace and your love, the knowledge that with you nothing is impossible. We need you to hold us in that space, bring us the comfort and reassurance that we need in those moments, in those Advent moments that feel so very dark. We thank you 
for the promise of the baby that will be in the manger. We thank you for loving us enough to never give up on us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.